Good. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you today. Just a small process point. If you want to have a copy of uh, my charts, you don't need to screenshot that. Um, look at the right corner of this chart. Send us email at slides at sergeyyang.com and we'll be very happy to share that. And <clears throat> the title of my talk is is obviously about money because this is important resource that we need to, need to dedicate to longevity and age-related movement. So, and the question is why longevity is the next trillion dollar opportunity. And I think it's, it's a very timely title because Apple just passed two trillion dollars market capitalization mark earlier this week. And when I compare this to trillion dollars that we all, uh, the value that we all attach to Apple and its products, I was just reflecting on two to four billion dollars number. This is, uh, which is one time, with the, which is difference of factor of 1000. This is the budget. This is the money that we dedicate to age related research and development globally. Uh, so this is currently probably the, just about the size of longevity sector. So our question is what needs to happen and when longevity can you know, become a $1 trillion opportunity for all of us, not necessarily only to Apple. So what I want to do today is to share our thinking inside longevity vision fund uh, is how do we think about the factors? which are driving development of longevity sector. And we'll go through demand because there's just a lot of shocking things which happening there and will force us to respond to that. And then we go through innovation and technology and we'll finish with two enablers. One is availability of capital. The other one is policies and regulatory changes that we all need to uh, make to arrive to very accessible and affordable version of longevity for everyone. This is just a summary slide. What do we think are the key shocks, key trends, and key macro factors on demand side? And I'll probably skip uh, demand uh, part of my presentation uh, because we all know these numbers. Uh, I'll just try to bring a little bit different twist to that. Um, we all know that population of people who are 60 years old and above will double by 2050. I'm 48, I'm actually part of this statistics. And, and we have a tendency to think that this is somewhere far away. This is just 20, 30 years down the road. And I had this view as well until I actually reviewed national longevity plan for Singapore last week and discovered that you know, Singapore will have 25% of the oldest citizens and a definition of all the citizens are 65 years and above in the next five years, sorry, it's by 2030. So forget about 2050, the silver tsunami, and this is why I like the term tsunami, which is used in these terms, is arriving much, much earlier to us. Uh, then bring us to the other obvious point, the older we are, the the higher and exponentially higher the chances to get one of the killer diseases. And I'm talking about cancer, diabetes, dementia, a different form of uh, heart disease uh, as well. And this is not the only bad news. I mean, it's usually much more complicated than that. If you are 80 years old, then you'll, you're very likely to have multiple chronic conditions, which are more complex and requires much more expensive uh, treatment. And this is, um, I was about to say complemented, and this is multiplied by unhealthy lifestyle, exactly the point that Greg raised uh, early on today. That And what we've done for the last few decades, in addition to poor diet and lack of exercise, we added a lot of uh, different bad habits and risk factors. Uh, insufficient sleep, uh, mental health problems, is actually a norm is in many developed countries. That's a problem. So my point in terms of demand, I don't think in the next five, 10, 15 years, we'll have any choice rather than allocating disproportional amount of capital of our focus of our resources into fighting 
age-related disease, and therefore bringing longevity in completely different level, uh, probably uh, hopefully comparable with um, Apple. Um, so then let's move to the other dimension here, which is innovation and technology. And I do think it's much more positive story here. Again, summary slide about three things that I wanna talk in, in the context of innovation and um, technology here. And uh, the first thing, and, and I'm actually very happy to observe it through the years, is a conceptual change which is happening in healthcare. Healthcare becoming much more proactive and personalized. And this is beautiful. And it's beautiful because it saves so many lives. It helps us to extend health span in addition to lifespan. And um, moreover, it's actually much cheaper. Depending on disease that you're gonna be looking at, uh, be proactive about this disease in terms of early detection and proactive treatment is sometimes five to 10, to 10 times uh, cheaper than addressing this in reactive mode in our today's mode. That's amazing efficiency, efficiency potential for the uh, technology and innovation that we have in here. And the reason I'm, you know, I'm, I'm using ZOXT patch here is because for third year, uh, I'm wearing this for seven days of my life, usually in January when I do my annual medical checkup. And it's amazing. And it's actually a refreshing alternative to conventional halter monitor that we all know. Um, the second factor around innovation is actually integration between technology and human. And I know a lot of people, specifically in the healthcare industry, who are very concerned about the arrival of new technology like artificial intelligence or robots into healthcare. They do think um, that sooner or later, they're gonna be replaced by the new technology and they will lose their job. I'm actually on the opposite side. I'm on more positive side than it. When I think about technology and human, I don't think about this in, in mutually exclusive terms. I think about this as, as an integration process and combination of the best of, um, of both. We all know that you know, combination of human doctor and AI will, will and already today, it, it just increased success um, in diagnostic rates uh, around you know, different type of diseases and it's helped to free up a lot of doctor time. So rather than spending 30, 30 minutes on looking at your MRI scan, uh, you know, doctor can spend um, this time with you and, and bring more human interaction, uh, which we lost a little bit for the last few decades in relationship between patient and doctor as well. It is about AI and drug discovery. I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. And it's also about robotics of different form, brought to our hospital, uh, hospitals um, and I'm a big fan of robotic surgery. I, in fact, I actually, just out of curiosity, I, I bought a uh, few shares of intuitive surgical in my personal equity portfolio and it was one of the best and successful investments uh, in my life, uh, thought in a pretty small scale. But um, I'm very excited that more and more players are establishing their footprint there like Johnson & Johnson with its enormous m and program entering uh, robotic surgery. And very recently I had a conversation with head of one of the major hospitals and they were like so happy that they moved into robotic surgery, um, uh, heart robotic surgery area because what has happened, they actually been able to offer heart surgery to many more patients a year and in fact, they actually have more work now rather than before. So that's exciting. And what also excite me, excites me is, is number of scientific breakthroughs that we, we've been able to achieve in the last decade or so. And we at Longevity Vision Fund particularly excited about genomic medicine. And I actually do believe that the major constraint that soon, probably five, 10, 15 years from now, the major constraint um, behind development and use of different type of um, 
you know, gene-related interventions is going to be ethics and regulation rather than the science itself. So, and I'm, I'm also very happy. It's, it's actually been helpful in terms of development of COVID-19 uh, vaccine. The other important uh, source of scientific breakthroughs for all of us is re regenerative medicine. And my uh, best and the most exciting story about the company that we invested in uh, uh, late last year called Light Genesis, they're Pittsburgh-based. And these are the companies which uses our own lymph nodes as bioreactors uh, to regrow organs. They start with liver. They currently undertaken the liver um, uh, program. And it's amazing that rather than, as today, you know, people waiting for $800,000 liver transplantation operation for many months, um, out of one donor liver, they will be able to help uh, uh, in a most cost-efficient way and give, it this, give this help to 50 to 80 patients, um, so, which I think is great. So then I wanna talk about two enablers and, and they, they are with a different side. While in, when I talk about capital, I talk about abundance of capital and we'll take a look at the figures. Uh, that's amazing uh, in terms of what is happening for biotech overall, for digital health overall. And then when, when I switch to regulatory and policies, I think it's today is, is a little bit with a negative sign. Only very small chunk of that actually goes to longevity age related research development and um, investments as well. But well, let's look at big pharma first. Um, Big Pharma is undergoing massive transformation and, and not only of technological um, and regulatory nature, but also because at least $200 billion of sales um, are at risk in the next five years due to the fact that you know, IP protection period uh, expires, which actually bring us to the record m and volumes. Uh, last year, I think it was just a little bit above $350 billion. So look at the magnitude of numbers here. That's exciting. And funny enough, big pharma and uh, academic grants were basically like the, mo the only sources of capital or funding for longevity related research or um, innovation just uh, decades uh, ago or so. And I'm very happy that two other big pockets of capital are arriving to our uh, sector. One is venture capital and we are very proud to have an opportunity to invest our uh, relatively small tickets with huge biotech funds like flagship pioneer, RNA capital, um, etc. And I'm pretty sure at certain period of time, venture capital would play significantly bigger role in terms of supporting uh, our uh, longevity innovation response uh, as a response to the uh, external shocks that I've defined early on. And then we also need to talk about tech giants and um, the use of Apple as an example is, is, is no coincidence. I'm a big fan of um, uh, Scott Galloway and his book, uh, The Four. I, you know, I have plenty of books to share in my office. And um, it's just basically about big tech and, and positive and negative sides of having these huge uh, companies in the, in the world. And I just recall his recent, one of his recent newsletters when he says that if Apple would like to continue to build shareholder value outside $2 trillion market capitalization, um, it reached recently, um, Apple would be forced to go to two things, healthcare and education. And I, I do believe that we all know the ability of Apple to disrupt the places and di disrupt the sectors. So I wouldn't be surprised if companies like Apple, Google, Microsoft, going to be essential part of capital provided, which would facilitate a creation of one trillion industry um, for longevity. And another enabler, and I, I uh, did, this, I did uh, mention that right now, until we 
cl actually classify aging as disease. There's no economic model which would support hundreds of billion dollars coming into longevity and age-related space. Having said that, I would like to point out into two pretty recent regulatory innovations that we all embrace. One is, you know, FDA acceleration programs around COVID, which I think work pretty well, and uh, Orphan uh, Drug Act, which already helped to approve 730 drugs to help people who are suffering from rare disease. And if you think about definition of rare disease, if you combine all of them, they're not that rare. The 400 million people around the world are suffering from that. So that's a substantial part of world population. Um, and just to finalize, so why aging in, is central? Uh, if you think from about this from human or from investment perspective, it's a huge unmet uh, need which exists today. There's more than 30 million deaths worldwide from age-related diseases. It's significant market opportunity. If you combine the value of all prescription drugs for age-related diseases, uh, which is sold globally, this is quarter of the trillion. And, you know, obviously, I think with, you know, all the factors that we discussed today, we have an amazing opportunity to combine it with regulatory reform, classifying aging as disease, and um, we'll all have we'll all have an opportunity to uh, watch how investment in longevity and, and age-related sector uh, will reach 50, 100 billion dollars in the next 5, 10, and 15 years. And if economic model exists for cancer, and cancer attracts 80 to 100 billion dollars of money every year, the same should exist for much more universal uh, root cause of so many disease, which would expand our health span and our lifespan. And we and Longevity Vision Fund are very happy to be a small part of the story, continuing our support to many companies in that space. Uh, we usually try to bring technological angle to uh, longevity innovation. And so you can see there's just a lot of our companies who has... Um, the um, so bringing the technological solution to the old healthcare problems. Um, that's probably it for today. Again, if you want to stay in touch, just go to sergeyyan.com, sign up for our, our newsletters. If you want to have a copy of these charts, uh, just send us email at slides at sergeyyan.com and we'll be very happy to share it with you.